Good evening and good morning. In the blessing of God's good creation, welcome to Face to Face, an event of Canadian Mennonite University called From Violence to Peace. Stories can change the world. Welcome all, so good to see your faces. My name is Cheryl Pauls and I serve as CMU president. In this time of COVID-19, we meet face to face in virtual form without sharing breathing space and with the joy of sharing stories of peace building across students and practitioners from CMU in Canada and from the Mindanao Peace Building Institute in the Philippines. In a few minutes, we'll hear prayers in the languages and faith traditions of tonight's participants in honor of our collective space. For CMU, a university in the Anabaptist faith tradition, we are honored to live and learn on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Dakota First Peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We are grateful for their stewardship of land and water and for their hospitality. These gifts enable us to live, learn, work, rest, play, and serve God the creator in this place. As we partake of these gifts, we commit ourselves to learn and respect the 1871 covenant called Treaty One. In this, we seek to enable restoration and reconciliation with and for indigenous peoples and to be good ancestors as stewards of land and relationships. CMU's face-to-face -face series engages timely and yet also long-standing matters, not from a posture of positions or sides, but from diverse vantage points, vocations and experiences. This morning and evening, I trust we will take heart in stories that stream together in peace from different starting places. And now I'm pleased to invite Dr. Wendy Craker to host this evening's conversation. Wendy is CMU Assistant Professor of Peace and Conflict Transformation Studies and Director of CMU's Canadian School of Peacebuilding. Wendy also has many connections and friends in the Philippines and will introduce tonight's storytellers. Thanks for bringing all of us together, Wendy. Peace be with all. Thanks, Cheryl, for those words of welcome. And now let me introduce Christine Vertucci, who is the Director of the Mindanao Peacebuilding Institute, or MPI as we say, to give her words of welcome for this day's event. Christine. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. With Canadian, Canadian Mennonite University and the Mindanao Peacebuilding Institute, I welcome you to Face to Face, a conversation among Indigenous, African, Filipino, and Canadian peacebuilders about peacebuilding and reconciliation deeply important issues in this complex and extraordinary time in which we are living. This forum is a concrete sign of the partnership between CMU and MPI, an actualization of our desire to partner together in order to foster understanding, mutual learning and exchange across borders and oceans. Together, we are building bridges between peoples from different continents that are strengthening relationships of solidarity, unity, cooperation, and learning as we face the challenges of the 21st century. Together, we are creating a critical mass of peace builders, starting here in the Philippines and Canada and expanding to all parts of the world that is building peace. Let us continue this journey together to transform our world into a place where justice, peace, and goodness prevail. Thank you and good evening and good morning to everyone. Christine, thank you so much. You have set the context for us beautifully. That's exactly what we are hoping has happened with the course that we're gonna be talking about this evening and for the inspiration for all of you listening today. So welcome everyone to the conversation for this evening or this morning. Now you might ask why this blend of CMU and MPI? Well, first point, I have been living and teaching in the Philippines since 1996, when my family and I went to the Philippines with Mennonite Central Committee. I began my connection with MPI specifically, which is an annual peace training event for peace builders in Asia, and pretty similar in intent to the Canadian School of Peacebuilding 
in 2003. And when MPI was forced to cancel their 2020 school due to COVID, we began to brainstorm together. And since CMU and MPI have developed a joint MOU, working together on a course became an obvious thing to explore. And thus began the Tuesday evening in Winnipeg or the Wednesday morning in the Philippines conversation via a course entitled Cultures of Violence, Cultures of Peace. And this brought together 16 diverse CMU students and 10 Filipinos employed in a variety of peace building organizations, all of whom are based on the island of Mindanao, a location that is no stranger to violence and the context of a newly signed peace agreement between the Philippine government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. So 16 participants well-versed in peace theory and 10 participants well-versed in the impacts of violence on communities began the cross-fertilization process of learning from each other. Taking this time to test out the merits of sharing space and storytelling towards an enhanced practice of peace building. In our worlds, our communities have changed in the process. We have changed in the process by building our courage to name the violences around us and to wonder how we begin to navigate the fragilities of our communities to build spaces for flourishing. With this course arrangement, Novi Rafaela, a staff member of MPI, became our very important tech assistant and icebreaker leader extraordinaire. And Michael Frankelar, Mike to all of us, became my co-facilitator for the course. He and I have known each other for more than 20 years and have taught together at MPI for nine years. And it is a pleasure to be reunited with him during this time at CMU. Mike is an independent consultant on conflict transformation, dialogue and peace processes with the World Bank and currently consults for them as the support to the Mindanao peace process as part of its fragility, conflict and violence team. Mike holds an MA in International Peace Studies. Welcome, Mike, to CMU and to this face-to-face. -face. So glad to have you here and to be working with you again. So, Mike, can you introduce our panelists from the Philippines? Well, first off, thank you, Wendy. Good evening, Winnipeg, and good morning, Mindanao. It is indeed an honor for me to co-moderate tonight's conversation with my good friend and colleague in peace building in the Southern Philippines, Dr. Wendy Craker. For today's conversation, we have with us two of the 10 participants in our course from the Mindanao Peace Building Institute. The first one is a social worker working with women and children who comes from the Manobo tribe, an indigenous community in the southern Philippine island of Mindanao, Eileen Barrios. The second one is an aspiring lawyer currently working with farmers who comes from the Muslim Maranao ethno-linguistic group in Mindanao, Mr. Anzanur Bubong. Wendy, can you tell us who will be joining Eileen and Anzanur in the panel from CMU? I will. So our CMU panelists are, first of all, a second year undergraduate peace and Conf conflict transformation studies student, Brina Link. She is from the Pequots Reserve here in Manitoba and resides in Winnipeg. And I have to tell you, Teaching with Brina in the class means you are on your toes at all times. She brings great passion to the classroom. Our second student joining us from CMU is a second year graduate student in the Peace Building and Collaborative Development major, Pamela Abonde from Nairobi, Kenya. Pamela brings years of experience working on peace and violence issues with women and girls in her home context. Welcome to Brina and Pamela. Now in the Mindanao tradition, as Cheryl's mentioned, as a way to honor the many peoples, ethnicities and faiths in that context, each community event begins with the prayers of the people's representatives. So you will hear prayers of blessing from our four participants in their mother language. We'll have Brina, Eileen, Pamela, and then Anzanur. Please Brina. Anin Buju, Miss Gosen, Redstone from the Black Wolf Clan. Iwi Nama Iwen Nan, Maba Asima, Min Wanod, 
Wena aningada, Bagi dini magam, Miguetch, Gada igam, Mimusham, Isina, Nig miwa, Nukumishin, Anik, Jiga, Bo, Gaya, Jig noon, Gamia, Jig, Ninwa, Wabaim, Igya Jig, Miguetch. You'll need to unmute Eileen. Amoy no diat yangit, iko na magbabaja. Inyod noy doon to atubangan noy, nubuligan kay si e no edo agon, ikapodot no to no kay man mga topiko no igbogoy kanami. Agon isab ikabogoy noy to mga duma noy no mga lumad. Dini na kutob pagyanghag no ikaw magbabaja. Madugi no salamat to presensya no ug duma duma preminti ka nami. Dungadan to magbabaja to anak to espiritu dos santos. Yan man iyan. Baba katika jina la yesu tuwa jambele yako tukisama ni asante ku. Tunakupenda na tunakuemedi na tukuna kuabudu. Tunakukaribisha wakati huu kwa hii mfano ambao tumeandaa ili tuweze tukazungumza na kuelewa na Mungu Baba tunakualika uwe kiongozi wetu na ni katika jina safi la Yesu Kristo naomba nikiamini amina Bismillahirrahmanirrahim <coughs> Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin arrahman arrahim maliki yawmiddin iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in ahdina as-siratha al-mustaqim siratha alladhina an'amta 'alayhim ghayri al-maghdubi 'alayhim waladdallin Ya Allah, make us one of those who repent and make us one of those who are pure. Amin. Amin. Thank you. We are in a sacred space where stories are shared. Thank you for those words of blessing. Our course on those Tuesday evenings and Wednesday mornings has explored the many faces and impacts of violence and ways to build a culture of peace. So we will have two sections, a conversation on violence and a conversation on peace. And we will begin each of the two sections uh, of conversation with a video montage of photos taken by all of the students in the class as an assignment to stimulate our understandings of the ways in which violence and peace can be viewed in our community. So let's begin with the photo montage on violence. Okay, so let us begin the conversation with our panelists. Um, so can each of you briefly tell us more about yourselves, the context or the communities you come from, and the kinds of violence that your communities have experienced? So perhaps I can start with Anzanur. Okay. Uh, good evening to everyone. I am Anzano Bulung from Philippines, particularly in Mindanao, Lana del Sur. I am a Maranao and I am also a Muslim coming from a royal family in our place. In terms of the context and uh, what my community experience about violence is structural violence. Rebellion in our place is being rampant, apparently for a reason that some politicians support these rebel groups in order for the politicians to keep and maintain their power and position in the government. And uh, these politicians 
see the poverty as an opportunity for them to keep their power because the people of the community engage into a rebel recruitment due to desperation because these rebel uh, groups provides uh, allowance seven uh, 50 to 80,000 per month that is up uh, equivalent to $1,500 just imagine every month due to poverty people engage in that just recently in our place we experienced Marawi siege lots of people died houses were burned into ashes and uh, even a war aircraft was used to launch an airstrike attack in our place every day. And the war between the government and rebel groups takes months, like four to five months. Just imagine every day, there is a uh, minimum of three airstrikes that shake the grounds that lead to destroy the capital city of the province, which is Marawi City. Rich and poor were displaced they go to uh, neighbor regions in order to uh, save themselves from the war. Lots of people suffered because of it. And after the Marawi siege, we experienced ambush because the election was, uh, we had our election 2019 and lots of ambush were happening in our place. So I guess it's safe to say that uh, violence is something you're very familiar with, Anzanur. Yes, sir. I have experienced a lot in bloodshed, ambush, and even experience, uh, actual experience that people died in front of me. Oh, that's very sad to hear. But thank you, Anzanur. Uh, can yes, we hear from you, Pamela? Thank you very much, Mike. Um, my journey into this peace work began one time after I was newly married and I was in the village and my mother-in-law invited me to a meeting. And I don't know why she insisted that I go because I was the youngest woman in that meeting. And what I realized in that meeting is that the women sat down on the ground and the men sat on the chairs. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the issue at hand was that one of the ladies had decided that she, she does not want her husband anymore. The reason being that her husband had in my culture when 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 a wife when um when a husband dies there's 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 there are men who go inheriting them wife inheritance so her husband had decided that he will be the the wife inheritor in the village so the woman stood up and she said no i do not want to die of hiv aids because those other women that you're going out to are all positive so she had refused and categorically she said, no, I do not want him in my house. So the whole clan had been called to this meeting and I sat down and I listened. And the saddest part is that the woman was not even given an opportunity to talk. Us, the ladies who were called were not even given time to talk. The men talked. And what shocked me is that the woman was ordered that you came here to get married. And can you get into your house, slaughter that chicken for your husband, and can he come back to the house? Wow. Needless wow. to say, two years down the line, the woman was dead, the man was dead, and the children were left as orphans. So this is my context that I come into peace building with, where women have lost their voices where social structures are constructed in such a way that they are so biased against women. And yet on Sunday, the churches are filled with these women, lifting up their hands, praising God, clapping and saying, praise the Lord. But these are women who are so disturbed. These are women who culture has dealt with yeah, in, in, in an unfair way, but with no voices where they can stand up and say no. Thank you, Pamela. Wow, that, that was such a powerful story. And I'm glad to see that there is one powerful woman from that culture is here with us today.
Moving on to Eileen, can you tell us more about yourself and your context and the types of violence that your community have experienced? I unmute. So, okay. Hello, everyone. So my name is Eileen Barrios. I'm from Bunawan, Agusan del Sur, and I belong to the Agusanun Manobo tribe. So there is a ang community. Ang amo na experience na violence is direct or structural. Direct kay daghan ug bata ug babae na ginakulata diri sa amo ah. So mao ang direct sa amo and for structural kay dito sa mountain areas na ay presence of military and NPA or rebel groups. So ang mga tao is uh, na hadlok sila dito ah, kay anytime mag magkabangi ang duha ka ta grupo and naapoy naagyo usahay nga magkabangi sila. So ang mga bata, babae ug Tanang pamilya dito sa mountain areas, mga naog yun diri asa syudad or diri sa sentro aron mag, magpalayo dito sa, sa gera. Okay, just give me some time to translate Eileen. Eileen is speaking the, uh, my mother tongue as well, which is called Cebuano, widely spoken in the middle of the Philippines and in the south. What she's saying is that in her community, they've experienced a lot of direct violence where women are often uh, battered uh, and even children. But there's also violence that uh, there's a lot of fear also, especially in highland communities with the presence of the military and the rebel groups where communities are caught in the crossfire between the rebel groups and the military. And therefore, there's a lot of displacement uh, causing some of them to go down to the lowland communities. Thank you, Eileen. Brina. Hi. Hi, I'm Brina Link from Pegwas First Nation. I'm a second year student at the Canadian Mennonite University studying peace and conflict transformation studies. I'm also on my second year on the Red Road. I'm an only child, but I come from a large close-knit family. Growing up, I've been part of Indigenous sacred ceremonies and still practice these today. My Indigenous community experienced violence from the ongoing impact of colonialization, loss of culture, loss of language, loss of land, loss of family connection, loss of human rights, forced isolation, lack of natural resources, lack of physical and mental health resources, and racism, racism and oppression. Within the city of Winnipeg, my community experienced violence is through substandard housing that is located in a violent drug and gang infested area. Schools in those areas have little to no resources while teaching with colonialized perspectives of an indigenous person creating self-racism. They are also experiencing police brutality and biased rulings within the justice system. As a result of this, a lot of children are taken and placed into a biased child welfare system. This course has enhanced my understanding of violence to include armed threats, rebels, controls over communities, lack of police authority, corrupt governments, male dominance, and no outlets for injustice. It has inspired me to come more of an active participant in the issue of murdered Indigenous women and men in Canada so I can outreach my work to other countries dealing with similar issues with the understanding that with the freedoms that I have. I'm also in, it also has inspired me to take the time to listen to people's stories from other countries and understand the violence that is a threat to their communities and enable me to reflect on how my own freedoms can be used to system the fight injustice. As Rebel Commander Chairman Iqbal said, forgiving myself is easy, but for my people, I can't forgive without justice. Thank you, Rina. Well, you've quoted uh, a good friend of ours there. Wendy and I have uh, worked closely with uh, Chairman Iqbal of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front in terms of his own peace. So I'll go on to the second question. And uh, I think Mike will unfreeze shortly. Uh, Brina, you started talking about um, uh, how the course has enhanced your understanding of violence. I'm going to ask you if you, have, if you have anything else that you want to add to that, uh, and then I'll go on to the other. So we've talked. You've just talked about violence, and in our course, we've talked about violence. How has the course and our conversations? expanded or adjusted the way in which you define violence. So, Rina, if you want to just highlight again what the course has done for you about thinking about what violence means. Sure. 
The course has enhanced my understanding towards violence because in Canada, we don't have armed threats, rebels controls over communities, lack of police authority, corrupt governments, male dominance, and no outlet for injustice. So it opens my eyes to the freedom that I do have as a Canadian and as a peace builder, the outlets that I do have that other countries are unfortunately lacking. Thanks, Brina. Eileen, let's hear from you. How has our conversation enhanced your thinking on violence? You'll need to unmute. Sorry. Because of this course, my, uh, my understanding on violence got deepened. So before, my understanding on violence is just hurting people, killing people. But through the sharings and stories I've heard in our class, uh, violence is also uh, poverty, not, not giving the, the people the, the needs that they want, just like that. And another thing is that the violence for me might be peace for you and peace for me might be violence for, for, ad, for others. And yeah. That's it. Thank you. Your last point, Eileen, I remember you saying that in class and many of the Canadian students kind of going, oh, really? Our peace could be your violence and your violence could be our peace. And so <laughs> you really hide it, highlighted for us when you said that the complexities that we're talking about here. Thank you. Pamela, Thank let's you. hear from you. And if you'll unmute. When I sat in this class, the first uh, few um, classes, I was wondering what is it about cultures of peace and cultures of violence? And through the sharing of stories and uh, learning from each other, I've come to realize that uh, our attitudes express our behaviors and our behaviors uh, determine what comes out in terms of violence or peace. So I have, I have come to learn that in every uh, conflict, there are beneficiaries. That was very profound for me. And uh, that uh, we have cultures that entrench violence, violence that is inculcated in our social norms that in my context plays out to demean the weaker people in society so that the people who have power, those who have power are able to bring down those and work down those who may not have the privilege of having that power. And uh, from attending the MCC UN conference, I came to realize with, within my context that even through this uh, crisis, giving an example of uh, this pandemic that we are going through, that in every crisis, there's an opportunity. So as peacemakers and as those who are studying violence, can we look for these opportunities in this crisis so that a crisis does not just go without us tapping into it? Thanks, okay. Pamela. And the photos that you folks saw were, were part of our attempt to do what you're talking about, Pamela, to really mm -hmm. open our eyes to the violence that is in front of us uh, because we have decisions to make about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anzanur. Okay, uh, during our first class in the I'm waiting and hoping that uh, his connection will come back to us. The different types of violence, especially. Oh, Anzanur, Anzanur you will need to start from the beginning because you were cutting out. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, during our first class in the course, I was really surprised that I never thought that this kind of course exists in the 
I consider because Canada, I consider Canada as a piece. And the course is fine. My understanding about different types of uh, different types of violence, which uh, should be implemented in our place as well, like sort of an awareness campaign uh, to enlighten the people about violence. Actually, the course helped me to expand uh, understanding about uh, violence. Thanks, Antonio. I remember you commenting after our first class of wow, I didn't think these kind of conversations happened in university. And uh, thank you. You have brought uh, a lot of real, uh, real life examples to us during the course. And uh, we've heard the sound of animals behind you as you're as you're talking. And so you're bringing your real life to us here this uh, this evening while well, morning for you as well. So thank you. Mike, over to you. Yeah, so we've heard some of you already allude to the conversations, the, a lot of the conversations that happen in class among yourselves. So I wonder, was there a particular story or was there something in your interactions with among each other or with your classmates, was there something that struck you? Or, or particularly you said that, that your understanding of violence was broadened. Was there a particular story or something that inspired you that led to this broadening or, or enhancement of your understanding of violence? Uh, maybe we can start with Pamela. Um, thank you, Mike. Um, the story that sticks out to me is the story of the Sulu. I hope I've pronounced it well. Yeah, <laughs> the, village, yeah. Yeah, the village of Sulu and... Uh, the type of violence that the Sulu is in the Philippines, uh, the type of violence that has been in existence in Zulu. Hey, am I pronouncing it well? Sulu. 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 Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> in Sulu, yes. And um, that every day between 15 to 12, 12 to 15 people were being killed every day because of interclan clashes. And uh, the fact that the community came together and with one person who spearheaded the leadership uh, of bringing the community together to talk, that has been curtailed. So that, that stands out to me and, and the fact that uh, when we are dealing with violence, we have to single out the dividers and the connectors in every uh, conflict and also when in my in my home we have a saying that says when when you when you see your neighbor being shaved when you see your neighbor's hair being shaved prepare yours and in, in terms of violence i can say that uh when my neighbor sneezes i will catch a cold none of us is safe when our neighbors are experiencing violence so we should know that violence in whatever form, because we live in a very interconnected world, we experience it, we may experience it in different ways, but we all experience it and we cannot say that one part is safe from the other. Yeah. Thank you, Pamela. Eileen, and if you can unmute yourself. So Eileen, was there a particular story that sort of had an impact on your understanding of violence? Yes, uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm going to talk in my language, sir, Bisaya. Go ahead. Explain it well. So, ang nag-impact din sa ako, kay katong nag-topic ta about arrange, <coughs> arrange marriage. Kay, di ba, sa, sa ilaha, ang kuan arrange marriage is conflict or violence. Sa amo, ah, or sa amo ang tri tribe, kay, mauna ang way, way to unite or make, make, make peace sa duha ka family nga naga conflict. So after hearing sa mga ano mga share mga stories or katong share atong isa namo ka classmate nga about arranged marriage as violence kay gina force niya ang tao sa pagpakasal sa dili niya kaila ug dili niya love. So what mao to mas na realize nako nga bitaw no ko ang gid ay dili gid di ay siya maayo nga i arrange ug pakasal ang duha ka tao kay before man god wala man god naka experience ana sir. So murag wala ra sa ako a ah, bahala sila kung magpakasal sila or dili so mauto ako ang na-realize nga tama yun ang arranged marriage kay violence niya okay 
So Eileen, uh, in, in one of the interactions, somebody shared apparently about arranged marriages. And I think if I remember right, Eileen, the, somebody shared about arranged marriages in India? Yeah. Okay. And apparently in Eileen's culture, they also have arranged marriages, but it is used as a conflict resolution method to join two families that are in conflict in a bond of kinship so as to resolve or reunite or uh, the conflict. Um, however, in their interaction, Eileen felt that the people uh, she was interacting with in the class saw arranged marriages as a form of violence because the man or the woman were being forced against their will to get married. Um, Eileen did feel that in the past, she felt like maybe this is violent, but that's somehow sort of, even if in her culture it is a conflict resolution method, that sort of confirmed her thinking that, yeah, maybe this is violent and just as a form of uh, an, an update. So that was what Eileen shared, an update. I think we just passed a law in the Philippines uh, banning child marriages. Okay, let's go move to Brina. Hi. Okay, so to me, it wasn't just one story that stuck out. It was that in Indigenous culture, relationships and community building is one of our key practices. So to be able to soak in every culture story, every different, every person's experience to me was really like taking a cross-cultural approach to one of the practices of my own traditions and learning through storytelling through that. I can't say one stuck, stood out to me because they all stood out to me. They all impacted me in some way because it's something I learned and something I didn't know. Thank you, yes. and. Um... I love how you are very inquisitive, Rina, and always asking us questions about uh, how is this in the Philippines? Um, keeps us, as Wendy said, you've been keeping us in our toes and we love it. Anzanur. Uh, during our group activity, one of our uh, teammates shared a story about fist fight. And I was surprised and lately I realized that we experience and see violence differently. Because uh, before, I only consider violence when it is uh, involved in heinous crimes, bloodsheds, killings. Because in our place, fist fight is just uh, just a normal thing that when you see someone is fighting through their face, that okay, just tell us when you are done. <laughs> so <laughs> really experience violence differently. So that is what's wrong during this rest. Yes, uh, yeah, this thing that in the Philippines, fist fight is just, yeah, it's something. Because apparently, as you've shared earlier, the violence that you experience is bigger than a fist fight. And therefore, the threshold of calling something violence is much bigger than, say, what they experience in Canada. Well, that ends our section on violence. So we're moving to the other part or the second half of our course, uh, which is about peace. So it's time to talk about peace. Uh, play the montage, please.
Okay, I understand that there was problem seeing our peace photos. Uh, there were some fabulous photos in that montage. And so um, I'm sad to hear that there was a glitch on that. You'll just have to take our word for it that there were really interesting uh, photos from around the world, actually, given the diversity of our students. I understand that someone in the audience has asked for Eileen, a, re a repeat of Eileen's comment during the violence section. She made a comment that uh, she realized as we were talking cross-culturally Canadians, well, and, and at CMU, it's not just Canadians in the class, uh, with the Philippines, that what we were defining as violence to some others might seem as, oh, that's something peaceful. <laughs> and when we're describing something peaceful, another group goes, whoo, that's kind of a violent act. And so the example for Eileen about our discussion around arranged marriages was shocking in many regards uh, to a variety of the listeners, uh, each coming at it from a different angle. So one of our realizations was the importance of really defining what we're talking about because we were realizing someone's violence is someone's peace and someone's peace is someone's violence. So that's the, the, the range marriage was one of the examples where that learning came across to us. So now we're moving to a conversation on peace. So let's begin this conversation with this question. As you think about yourselves, your context, your life, how would you describe what is your peace work? And so Eileen, let me start with you this time. What, what would you say is your peace work? And unmute. So right, right now I'm working at the people's organization serving the indigenous people. So I'm assigned in peace building pro program. So basically our, pro our activities is all about peace work. So our work is, uh, some of our works are awareness sessions or yeah, awareness raising. Uh, some of those are human rights. We give human rights uh, seminar to the IP community, women and children's rights. Uh, positive discipline training for the parents and also we have the gender gender training and we also have temporary shelter wherein we we serve and we help the women and children being abused by their family so that's my kind of peace work thank you Eileen it's helpful to understand where you place yourself with the kind of answers that you're providing here this during this event Pamela, what is your peace work? My, my peace work, I perceive my peace work as my calling because I um, have been doing peace work uh, for the last 17 to 18 years in the community, uh, more particularly when it comes to women empowerment, women rights, girl child rights, and um, poverty in the community. And this brought me to another level where I realized that many women uh, go to church. The church in Kenya has more women than men. So then um, I, 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 I shifted my mind into what about doing this peace work in the context of the gospel? And that is when I found myself in the church working with women in church and to this end, we have uh, a women missional training that we train women to give them a, a voice, to empower them, to realize that uh, uh, women also can make a difference in their own local spaces, creating safe spaces where women can come and share, creating safe spaces where women can be vulnerable with each other, where women can get to, 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 to know that they are custodians in the place where God has placed them and how they can use that space to spread peace in the community. That is what I am doing currently, yeah. Thank you, Pamela. Anzanur, what is your peace work? Uh, in terms of peace work, uh, I have uh, chosen the career of community engagement 
uh, where I give lectures to uh, where I give lectures about subsistence agriculture and uh, provide seedlings and equipments for farming uh, by taking initiative to facilitate the links between the government and private institution to help the community to engage in uh, subsistence farming so that they could uh, secure uh, their daily meals for survival and prevent them from joining into rebel groups. And also I am a teacher in senior high and junior high where I lecture also about values education to teach my students that this is right and this is wrong, something like that. Thanks, Antonur and Brina. Well, because I'm an, the only self-identified Indigenous person in the course, I have a different perspective because of my positionality. This means for my piecework, I need to speak out and highlight the injustices of my Indigenous community. I also encourage a platform for voices of Indigenous students through events that highlight the issues of violence within my community and bring healing ways to those members. Within CMU, I'm an active member of the Indigenous Initiati Initiatives Advisory Committee. My piecework also includes working with my employment to preserve Indigenous languages. Thanks, Brina. Now, each of you, well, I asked you, what is your piecework? Uh, I think for this group listening, I'd like for you to talk about what is your understanding of peace? When you're using that word, what do you mean by peace? And we've talked a lot about that in the course and the challenges of doing that. And so I'm just going to run it back up again. So starting with you, Brina, um, you were very deliberate to say what your peace work was and your positionality. How are you defining peace? What's your understanding of that? My understanding of peace is internal and external. My internal peace is someone, someone living with the right to choose and the means to obtain a fully fulfilled life. For myself, it is living through the seven sacred teachings, which is respect, honesty, love, truth, humility, courage, and wisdom. The external peace is to have everyone given the opportunity to meet their hierarchy of needs. This, so the psychosocial, I can never say this word, sociological <laughs> needs, safety needs, belonging and love needs, esteem needs, and self-actualization. Thanks, Brina. Anzanur, how are you using the word peace? If we define peace, technically speaking, it's a very broad term. But uh, to sum it up, generally, peace is when you achieve contentment, uh, contentment in a way that the family could eat three times a day and can afford education for their children. I think that is peace for me, contentment. Thanks, Antonor and Pamela. Um, peace, in describing peace, um, I don't know how we can describe peace without violence, but I can say that my understanding of peace is in my everyday. Uh, I have, through this course and my interaction with my classmates, I have come to carry this close to my heart that my, my peace has to be intentional. I have to go out intentionally to create that peace from myself personally, spreading it out to other people so that it becomes a process, a deliberate process where we, we, we build onto what, onto what we have. And as a Christian also, my peace work uh, means that it's finding wholeness. How can we find wholeness in our everyday? How do we find wholeness in what we do? How do we find wholeness with ourselves, within ourselves, with each other, and with nature? Because for me, peace is shalom, and shalom is completeness in God. So that is my understanding of peace. Thanks, Pamela. And Eileen? So, so peace for me is when people, are, uh, people feel safe and secure, other basic needs are met, uh, their rights are respected and the people are respecting each other's differences no matter what their race are, color, ethnicity, gender, and religion. So that's basically the piece for me. In Thank you. Now you've heard very brief answers from them about what peace is and in some ways it's a bit of a disservice to ask them this question of what their understanding of peace is given that 
Well, we've been meeting for about 10 weeks and uh, it took about 10 weeks for them to get to this sort of precise kind of definition that they could share with you. It would be nice if we could have given you kind of the fly on the wall kind of uh, experience of, of hearing the kind of debates and conversations and what about this and and how can you say it's personal? How can you not see the structural dynamics and having that very rich kind of conversation? So Mike, that takes us to the question that you're gonna ask them. Yeah, but before we go there, Wendy, uh, nevertheless, we see that in their responses, their definition, you see a lot of the context that we've heard earlier yes. in terms of how they see peace, how they see violence as well. But just before we go on and seeing that we have a bit of time, just before we go to that last question for them in this section, um, Pamela mentioned uh, something that I've also learned, as you realize here, I'm also learning while co-facilitating this mm. course, this idea of everyday peace. Can you expound on this a little bit? And what does this mean, this everyday peace? Uh, Mike, uh, thank you very much. My everyday piece in my context um, is, is the fact that I have to be whole within myself first for me to be able to offer, uh, to extend to somebody else. So as a Christian, my peace is found in my wholeness, in my completeness, in my knowing who I am, in my, in my being, um, in, in it, in my, it, how do I put it? Who am I anchored in and what anchors me? And then I'll be able to share it out to others. And every day meeting with the people that I meet with, in my context, I say that as a woman, my peace starts from where I am. My peace starts with my family. And if we have 10 women who's, who realize that their peace is within the defined spaces that we have, then it spreads out to the community. And when the community is at peace and we are able to feed our children, we are able to take our children to school, we are able to get water, we are able to get food, then it spreads out to the country. And then our young people are also able to participate in this. So right. my everyday, that is what I describe as my everyday, not looking at the bigger picture, but my everyday in the grassroots flowing up into the bigger picture and creating a community that is living at peace. Thank you, Pamela, for um, painting such a vivid picture there. Wendy, you want to jump in and tell us theoretically what that is as well? <laughs> well, Mike, you're giving me an opportunity to talk about uh, my upcoming book. Am I supposed to say that right now at this point? You're giving me that opportunity? Yes. I mean, I mean this is a term in the peace building field, everyday peace building. Um, and comes out of acknowledging that peace building needed to swing more to looking at what are the assets and resources that come out of local peace building actors and to, to validate and see that's where real change is, is needed, where we live on a daily basis. And those efforts of how we decide to communicate with our neighbor when there's a, a conflict over you know, what side of the fence the mangoes fell on uh, to how we deal with facing people with arms, as you've described, Anzanur, and the bloodshed and killings that's happening in our context, how we choose to relate in that neighborly, everyday format is something that had not really been in the 70s, 80s, 90s, as this peace building field was emerging was looking more at state-led processes as opposed to local actor peace building. And so it's really only in the last 10 years that there has been this encouragement around looking at tradition, traditional and local wisdom in terms of what peace building is. And that's been coined as everyday peace building. And with I, I, that, I, sorry, I like this term because it makes peace, at least for me, someone who's worked in the state versus rebel sort of negotiation. I like it because it makes peace a bit more achievable, a bit more real uh, and down to earth. Yes, absolutely. And Brina uh, kind of hinted at that uh, with your comment about saying, from my positionality, and it's these intersectional studies 
or approaches to our disciplines that's kind of um, uh, brought this very fertile conversation forward of saying, who are we, our context, where do we come from? How is that shaping in the ways in which we bring our, our questions, our behaviors and attitudes to the challenges that are in front of us? One of the stories that I told in class from a research project that I did was meeting with Muso, who is an Islamic scholar and head of an Islamic institute at Ateneo de Davao. Uh, I asked him this same question. So what's peace to you? And he said to me, well, Wendy, yesterday I met with another PhD student and I gave him a very good theoretical answer of what he says. And so I got my pen ready and I thought, okay, he's gonna give me the same theoretical answer. And uh, my head was kind of down, ready to take some notes. And I look up and I see that there are tears coming down his cheeks. <laughs> and we just pause there in silence for a moment. And he says, but that was yesterday. And I said, why was that yesterday and not today? And he said, two hours after I gave this beautiful theoretical answer about what is peace, my aunt, her granddaughter, my niece were killed in an ambush by a, a feuding family. And he says, now I don't know how to define peace. Because now I, as a, as a chief or a young Datu in the community, I have to go back to the community on the weekend. And they are going to want to do the killing that Anzanur has described to seek revenge. And he says, now I don't know how to define peace. So our stories and our experiences, who we are, real people in real places with real questions, becomes that everyday peace building, where we're really trying to achieve something, as you say, bringing something real and not just sort of pro programmatic plans that happen in offices in our capital cities, um, away from really where people are living and suffering um, the consequences of conflicted spaces that aren't resolved. And so these questions that we've just asked them, is a question for all of us. What is your peace work? And, and how are you framing that peace that you're working at? Um, because it reveals who you are, what anchors you, as you said, Pamela, um, shaping the direction of, of who we are together with others. Yeah, and as Pamela said, hopefully the small little pieces that we work on every day can reverberate within our communities and the yes. bigger nation. I'm down to the last question. Shall I go there? Yes. So again, this is similar to what I asked you earlier in the violence section. We've had, as a part of our methodology in class, we give you time to interact um, between the Canadian or students within Canada and those in Mindanao. And in a lot of the stories, or you've heard a lot of stories from both sides, was there a particular story that sort of struck you or added a new dimension to your understanding of peace? Was there a story that reshaped your understanding of peace? So maybe we can start with Brina. There was actually four stories that stuck out to me. I'll be brief. The first story was when a classmate shared on the dangers of the humanitarian work in the Philippines. This came as a surprise to me because of the Canadian culture's openness to peacekeeping within our country. The second story that stuck out to me was knowing that in some areas of the Philippines, Sulu in particular, where people do not have the freedom to seek, seek a safer environment. The third story was from Nairobi, where there are no policies put in place to protect employees from un unjust dismissal and work safety conditions and attaining proper wages. The fourth story, sorry, I just, um, the fourth story to me was, we lost you. Sorry, I'm back. There you are. 
girls there. Um, I blanked. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. So you've, turned out, you've told us three stories, right? That sort of stuck you. But how did these stories impact your understanding of peace? Oh, by, it was more opening my eyes to not just the, like, what I, when I see the understanding of peace is I have a clear understanding of peace within me. But when I see the dangers of the peace work in the Philippines or the different policies in other countries or the no safe of freedom, I kind of look at my peace as like opening my eyes is how much freedom I have with peace in my own country. And, oh, and this was the fourth story I remembered is when we were doing the peace, the pictures of peace in the Philippines, something peaceful is just having a small house and a rooster or something was so peaceful. And here in Canada, we live to excess. So to that, to us, that wouldn't be peaceful. So it was just the understanding of peace is more of the simplicity of freedom and the simplicity of what people have. Thank you, Brina. Anzanur, what about you? Was there a particular story that struck you and sort of redefined peace for you? Uh, yes, sir. During our group activity, one of our classmates told us a story about differences. And I get the wisdom behind the story that... Uh, Differences is very essential uh, to know in terms of uh, socializing because <clears throat> it would help us, excuse me, it would help us to uh, make uh, room for adjustments because it is very essential to know the differences in order for us to achieve peace and order. We should have an empathy which uh, many of us doesn't have it because when you know the differences, you can adjust. Like, uh, this one is a Muslim, this one is a Christian, this one is a Buddhist, this one is uh, any religion. So by that, we would uh, make room for adjustment and achieve peace and understanding. Thank you, Anzanor. I remember a class I took when I was in grad school that asked the question, what happens when we see difference as diversity? And that speaks a bit, a little about what you were saying about appreciating and being sensitive to difference. Pamela, can you tell us, was there a story that sort of struck you and redefined peace for you? Um, I'm sure my, my husband is here watching and I will, <laughs> I will say this. <laughs> well, um, you, can, you can say what, hi to what, him. What's his name? <laughs> his Patrick. Patrick is somewhere here watching, yeah? Hello, Patrick. And, Listen up. <laughs> and even the women that I work with in Kenya are here watching. So I hey. want to say, yes, I want to say that uh, what stuck with me is, you know, not being able to imagine possible new frameworks in peace building and, and, and not being uh, apologetic about being able to transgress. You know, that social change we need, to, we need to step up and imagine social change. And we need to step up and be the voice that will be counted so that we set pace for, for the, the framework that is going to change uh, the, the narrative within the peace concepts that we are, we are working with. For example, for me in church, am I able to stand up and be counted? Am I able to stand up and be the voice? Am I able to stand up and... And, and, and give up, lend a voice to the voiceless, to the voiceless. and even uh, be able to stand up and, and, and say no, when the no now will mean a better yes tomorrow. So that is what I've learned, and, and that is what I take away. Yeah. Thank you, Pamela. And I think in class, we talked a lot about agency and how rediscovering that we have the power to make ourselves be counted to actually uh, to, to, um, uh, be able to voice out our concerns. Eileen. Yes, sir, Mike. What was the story in Bisaya, that sir. You? Okay, go ahead. Actually, sir, I actually daghan kayo nag-struck sa ako. Okay. Daghan kong mga bitaw no moments sa ato ang klase. Pero ang isa sa mga murag nagbalik-balik sa ako sir is katong gipatan o mi og katong document documentary entitled Right and Wrong Stories of Justice and Forgiveness kay nag-sharing mi adto mga by groups so, with Canadian students og kami taga sa Philippines 
ang ako yung permanent ma remember is dili lang ang justice ang makahatag og peace sa imuha kundi pati ang pagpasaylo lisod siya buhaton pero pag pero pag imo na siyang mabuhat good kay mo makahatag siya peace sa imuha sa imuhang personal life sa imuhang kaugalingon and para mo gusto ako if nakay peace sa imuhang kaugalingon pwede makahatag pud kag peace sa ubang tawo kay if wala kay peace sa imuhang kaugalingon lisod maghatag og peace sa ubang tawo mo na ang murang Wow. Um, yeah, I remember that was a powerful documentary. So Eileen was talking about part of the methodology in class that we asked them to watch this documentary called Right and Wrong. What was the full title again? Uh, excuse me. Stories of Justice and, and Forgiveness. Forgiveness. And the, after that documentary, we had the class um, discuss. And in that discussion, uh, Eileen was saying there were a lot of what she calls eureka or aha moments. But one of the things that really uh, struck her was this idea that justice may not be enough or justice alone may not be enough to give you peace. And that it is forgiveness is also important, particularly to have peace within oneself. Because she says, although it may be difficult to forgive, but if you have peace within yourself because of forgiveness, then you may be able to share that peace with others. Thank you very much, Eileen. And on that note, th this takes us to a close of our second and last section on peace. And so I think uh, it's time to see what our audience online are curious about. Um, Wendy, can you start us off with the first question from our uh, friends tuning in online. Yes, thanks, Mike. So the first question, there are a number of questions and Pamela, yes, there's questions from people from Kenya. And I wondered why are there people from Kenya uh, asking questions? So thank you, Pamela, for bringing your, your friends over and they have some questions for you. So Mike might choose one of those uh, questions from friends in Kenya. I'm going to start with uh, Richard from Alberta. And he has sensed the challenge that we have been having in class. That the word violent, violence, the word peace, they're small words that have big pictures and experiences connected to them. He's curious specifically about the word violence. He's listened to your stories and he wonders what other ways of talking about violence and its impact on people's lives and on you have you started using because violence is just too small a word for the big issues that we've needed to talk about. So what are some other ways to talk about are conflicted or experiences or experiences of conflict um, other than just saying, oh, that's violence. So what are the ways in which you talk about these kinds of experiences that impact you deeply? What other phrases or words do you use beyond just the word violence? So for any one of you, what would be a response you'd make to Richard? What are some ways that he emerged for you as ways to be describing um, these very painful community or personal experiences? I think Brina wants to start us off. Yes. Go ahead, Brina. Um, oh, yeah. You looked eager there, Brina. <laughs> <laughs> I think violent is just a, an adjective that you can use, like a word. But I think with that, there's so many layers. Like we were taught in class, there's something called the tree model, where there's the roots of stuff you can't see, like the trunk of like some things that are visible, and the tree is the behaviors from the violence or the act. So I think it's more, instead of just identifying the word, you want to identify the underlying causes in me, start identifying violence with those sort of words first, because that's really the roots of it and what you're trying to fix. So that this idea of there's the visible and the invisible and that we really need to give the time to the root causes, that which really lays the foundation for yes. some of these incidents to happen. Thanks, Brina. Anyone else want to um, expand I'll, I'll on that? Pamela? Okay. 
I would add to Richard that um, there is hope. I hold on to hope. And I, I believe that violence and peace coexist. And there's really a very thin line between violence and peace. But despite all that, there is hope. And we should hold on to hope even as we work towards uh, building uh, peace in whatever context that we work with and we work in. So that even at the grassroots levels, we should identify, we should be the voice to the voiceless. We should be the people who understand the meaning and implication of peace. We should be the ones to stand up and be the voices. We should be the people to stand up and be the, you know, work towards getting an agency in the community and be a force that will, will be had. Because if nobody speaks, then nobody will act. So we have to speak, we have to listen, we have to tell our stories, and we have to change the narrative and work towards peace building. And it's for everybody, it's a concerted effort so that every small piece like a jigsaw feels and we get the complete picture. So in a sense, silence creates the space for vi or silence creates the space for violence to move in. Mm -hmm. And that's your emphasis on voices being so necessary. Voices. Yes. We should Thanks. talk out. Yeah. Eileen or Anzanur. Some response uh, to this? Very any question. Uh, in order for us to achieve pieces, mm -hmm. we should promote the dignity of the people because by this we could achieve uh, peace in order we wouldn't do something inhuman to each other this is... yeah you're okay we may have lost Anzanur for the moment anything you'd like to say Eileen in terms of maybe even in your uh in your languages, or what are some of the ways that violence is talked about? That might be, Mike can translate, but yeah. in science, say, what are some of the ways you talk about violence? Okay, di ba gistorya na nato nga nita violence? Unsay sa pinagi pinagi aning atong mga pinagistorya dere sa course? Unsay lain unsa sa sa na unak ni mo? Unsay lain tawag sa violence? nga mas uh, malawak pa o mas lalum. Mm -hmm. Pwede sa imong kultura, unsa tawag ni mo anak niya. Oo. Oh, oh. So amo amang good sir, basta mayon ka violence is patay diretso. Ana kay katong akong gis eh, katong murag gisend nako sa inyo ni, ni Wendy, katong about sa uh, magahat ato mo gid among pinaka main na violence nga ginakuan sa amo ang community sa manubo lang sa manubo community lang sir katong magahat na uh, revenge through killings katong hutdon gid nilang tibuok pamilya sa usa ka kalaban nila anak pero tungod sa kurso nato ni 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 broaden ba ni lawak ba ang imong pagtan-aw sa violence oh, oh sir dili lang ka nang pag katong dili lang siya nga patay lang o oh, patay lang or revenge but also kanang pag dili paghatag og mga kanang social services kay usually sir sa sa mountain areas layo kayong eskwelahan so ang mga bata dili ka eskwela ang mga mga mama nga buntis nga mga anak is layo ang center so it's either mga anak ra sila dito sa sa barrio or mamatay sila tungod sa pagpanganak or safe sila or dili sila safe sa pagpanganak anak lang sir Salamat, Eileen. Wow, Eileen is talking about um, in her community, violence is primarily seen as killing. Particularly, there's a phenomenon called magahat, which is revenge killing, that if a family um, does something to another family in revenge, in retaliation, they'll kill the whole family in retaliation. It's a big thing. But because of our course, uh, she's expanded this idea of violence, that it goes just beyond killing, that the fact that children are unable to access education because uh, the provision, the, the inability of, of, of governments to provide services such as education, that is violence for her now. And also the situation of some women who live in, in, in areas 
where there are no hospitals or birthing or facilities where given women could give birth, that some of these women often die giving birth because they don't have access to hospitals. So that, for her also now, is violence. Thank you, Eileen. Um, do we have Ansanur back? No, but let me just say something that he has uh, he emphasized earlier, and then we'll go to your next question, Mike. Okay. Anzanur, I heard you say uh, that really we cannot have peace without justice. And I would say, Richard, that in our conversation about violence, if if justice doesn't get its 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 way into the conversation, violence uh, will fill the space. So a, a, a kind of peace that just tries to keep uh, the waters calm or a harmony will not be enough in some of the the situations many of the participants from the course come from. And without uh, an attention to justice, uh, violence does take over in those situations. Mike, over to you for a question. Okay, so Pamela, you've got, you've got actually two questions here and it's interesting because one uh, is about young people, youth, and the other is about the women that you were talking about. So I'll throw the two questions at you if you can take notes and then if you can um, answer them one after the other. So the first one is on young people. What are the viable drivers of youth participation in peace building activities in Kenya so as to see exploration of the contributions of youth to peace and security uh, that should transcend what we call the victim and perpetrator stereotypes that may include how young people actively contribute to the prevention and resolution of violent conflicts. That's a, it's a very long one, but I think it, it asks for what are some you know, approaches to get more young people involved in peace building. The other one, and I'll just, if you can take note of the first one, how do you ensure that your peace work is not perceived as creating or enabling rebels? Since the women that you were talking about may eventually become vocal in their communities and be seen as rebels. So, Pamela. Um, there, is, there is space for young people. But as I said, peace work is intentional. So there should be an intentional move to invite the young people in the community to to participate in the in the various peace processes that uh, are initiated by the community, whether it's in the church or out in the community, because we find that, for example, in in my country, young people have been have been used so much by by politicians to 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 cause mischief and mayhem, and uh, once the politicians are uh, are elected, they are dumped. So what are, we are saying that uh, when, when an intentional process that includes young people in, in what we can term as having an agency by the, by, by the young people and getting a voice in, of the young people incorporated at all spheres of, 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 of development, building their capacity and just allowing them to, to voice and to participate in different forums I think for me, we'll, we'll, we'll take away this story of stereotyping that young people cannot offer anything. And going to my second question of women as rebels. Yeah, wow. how do you prevent them from becoming rebels since you're empowering them? Wow, this, this narrative, who, 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 who in the first place, <laughs> who in the first place uh, propagates this narrative that when women know, when women realize, when women have the knowledge, when women get the skills, they become rebels. Yes. This is, this is, this is what we should, be, we should be working against because when a woman is empowered, when a girl is empowered, the whole community is empowered. So realizing that women can have a voice, women can speak, women can contribute, and women can can be the change that is needed. They can be the agency and the, and the agents of change that is needed. It does not make women rebels in any way. It, in fact, empowers the whole community and, 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 and makes a community a strong community, a community that can give space to its women, whether it is in church or out in the secular world, is a very strong community. Yeah. 
Thank you, Pamela. Wendy, I don't, um, can I extend this question because Eileen also works with women and children. So I want to extend this question along the same line to Eileen. Um, how do you see, because I know you work in your community with women and children, and you work often with women who are battered, whose human rights have been violated as victims. But how do you see the importance of, or how can women be empowered to work for their own protection and even young children? Okay, lah, nasab ni mo, or ako translate. Yeah. So, ang amo ang way, anak, sir, is to katong maghatag lagi ang mga awareness raising sa ilaha. Katong ipa, kay kasagaran mang good, sir, kay. Katong before kanang naka-interview ko og gikuan nga tinga nang wala ka na wala ka nakasumbong before ana-ana kay wala man ko kabalo ma'am nga nain ana nain ani nga mga mga balaod sir mao nang sa kada to hala dapat dapat makabalo ang community so ang among gibuhat is katong magpahibalo sa ila katong mo dili lang sa ila pati sa ilang mga anak og gahatag pud big ano sir kanang livelihood training programs kay para para pagmubiya sila sa ilang pamilya naa siya ika income kanang kaugaling ng income kay syempre usually ang mga mama sa amua kay sa balay lang man nagaste so at least na sila ma, ma matabang sa iyang pamilya sir okay so, so mabili, Aileen, sir. thank you Eileen Eileen is talking about how she reflected on on one of the interviews she had with a woman who was battered by her or beaten up by her husband and she asked why didn't you complain why didn't you report him and apparently the woman said because i didn't know that i had such a right and to her, you know, this, this, this was very critical so that their program now works on informing, making women aware that there is such a law against uh, these things and that they have rights, including their children, that their children have rights too. And moreover, they've instituted um, livelihood uh, programs, capacity building programs to give women livelihood so that if they do decide to leave, then they can stand on their own feet. Thank you, Eileen. Over to you, Wendy, for the next question. Thanks, Mike. This next question is for Eileen and for Brina. This question is from John from Winnipeg. And John has been inspired by these two very strong indigenous voices from different parts of the world. And he says, often we think, you know, the world it, you know, the first world has a certain set of realities and what might be deemed the third world or the developing uh, countries have another kind of reality. But he's wondering if the two of you, by being in class together, have found some kind of parallel, some commonalities between the two of you as you struggle to be Indigenous, usually minorities within your context, Indigenous women and experiencing talking about systemic and structural violence. Mike and I purposely put you as several times together in the same group, hoping that you would enjoy the conversation that you would have together. So John came to, came to that kind of question too, wondering as the two of you have talked in class, where are intersecting points as you talk about being indigenous women struggling with systemic structural violences in your context? Brina and Eileen. Okay. For me, what I've noticed is we've, because the indigenous people in the Philippines and in Canada have both gone through colonization. So we both have dealt with the loss of lands. We're dealing with trying to find, like, fight for human rights, like basic human rights, affordable housing, proper resources. So those are all inter like intersecting. But one thing I also noticed with our Indigenous cultures, this also includes Pamela's too, is when we go back to the Indigenous culture of any country, there's a lot of simil similarities and shared beliefs, like within our practices, our ceremonies, our rituals, there's sort of kind of more of an understanding in my mind. Mm -hmm. Eileen, a response, and Pamela, feel free to join in on this conversation also. I will speak in beside you, sir. Oh, oh. 
Ah uh, sa mong interaction ni ni Miss Brena Brena is murag ma-feel ma- nimo na naagi connection ang ano ba murag ilahang ilahang tribo o amo ang tribo kay murag o oh, na ang mga rit na nami mga rituals and murag na similarities gid ana gud sir murag na similarities pati pod ang amo ang situation murag makapil ko nga murag ay ma-feel na ko unsa ihang na feel ana gud sir So I mean is saying that in the interaction she she feels a lot of the connection between her tribe and and Brina. One is in terms of the rituals, uh, that there are some similarities. And even to the point that the situation that Brina's um, uh, group is in, that she feels it as well because similar things may also be happening in her community. So she feels the connection. Mm -hmm. Pamela, anything you'd like to add? Thanks, Brina and Eileen. I think there is, uh, for Canadians listening into this conversation, a sense of uh, trying to invest in what reconciliation might mean between settlers and Indigenous people and not having that many opportunities to, to hear stories of Indigenous people from different parts of the world, uh, hearing those kind of common struggles and ways of articulating what the violences look like. And so uh, we have felt this in our class, definitely, that we've had this wonderful opportunity of these weaving of stories that we didn't know were connected or could be woven together until we all got into the same place to have those conversations. Wendy? Yes. I'm going to backtrack a bit and ask Anzanur something about young people's participation. Anzanur? Um, because particularly in Anzanur's context, where the Marawi city was put under siege, mm -hmm. and right before that happened, there was a lot of talks about young people being recruited by the ISIS-inspired mm -hmm. terrorist groups. And still there are fears right now lingering about ongoing possible radicalization. So I want to ask Anzanur, um, being a young person yourself already <laughs> working for peace, what do you think? How can we engage young people to become more involved in peace building and to take them away from this idea that they are just mere recruits or victims, but actually have the agency to work for peace themselves? Any ideas, Anzanor? <coughs> uh, for me, sir, in order for us to prevent this recruitment from the youth is that we've already done this before and until now. Uh, even actually university students engage in this recruitment of rebel groups. Yes, because when they meet a friend that is part of the Maori group or any rebel groups, they enlighten that we should fight for our land. The government is, uh, the government is harming us uh, under the table. So in order for us to defend our land, uh, you should join us in this. And by that, the students would realize that we are really suffering in our land because of the poverty. And uh, also they uh, <laughs> offer some uh, daily allowance or later. they also offer monthly allowance that somehow uh, the student can be considered as an incentive to join into such rebel groups. So by this, our initiative is we form a social civic organization where we mobilize the, all of the university students to engage in an one organization that promotes uh, community engagements. So we give lectures about leadership enhancement, personality development, and uh, values, and uh, yeah, yeah, sort of an community engagement. So by that, the youth would realize that we can do so much more as a youth. We don't have to engage in rebel groups in order for us to make a change in our community. Yeah, I remember you talking about this in our class when we were exploring this idea of CMU as a yes, peace sir. zone, uh, that your idea that in your university, there was possibility for young people or students to actually engage uh, in community service or reach out to their greater community as a way for them to get involved. Um, I, w I want to, Wendy, can I go to this question on peace and what the government can do? Well, Mike, actually, I was going to say, looking at the time, oh, um, we need to be moving to our closing event. And before we do that, uh, let me name some of the questions still lingering. 
Uh, they may come back to our classroom conversation, but want to at least uh, the audience know more of the kind of questions that were emerging. Um, so a question that was being asked for you, Brina, is now, I, since we asked the question about violence, uh, what do you think peace is and what do you think governments, and this is from a Canadian, uh, could do to promote peace? So this is just to further your thinking and just throwing it out there. Uh, Pamela, Terry from uh, Winnipeg says, I was struck by your comment, the no today will be the yes tomorrow. And uh, Terry really wanted an example from you of, of what that looks like. So just for you to know, people are curious about that idea on your part. And then another question coming forward, what role does toxic masculinity play in the role of violence? We've talked about women, we've talked about youth, uh, we haven't named men or masculinities in particular. Uh, how does that play into peace building processes, especially since most uh, world leaders are male? And uh, so what might be what might be the impact of that? So I'm just going to leave our panelists with with those questions to further your own thinking. And to thank the audience very much for the questions that you have put forward. And uh, I think you've challenged our panelists and you've also sent some of the dilemmas <laughs> and challenges we've had in the class of the kind of conversations and struggles we've had to try and sort through these very complex terms and uh, the complexities of our relationships within that. We wanted to close with something very Filipino. <laughs> and so there's a particular kind of way in which often talk shows end. It is with something called the quick fire round. So Mike, over to you for the quick fire round. Okay, as a way of ending this for the quick fire round, I'll be throwing words at our panelists and I want them armed with their marker and a piece of paper to quickly write down. So are you ready with your markers? to quickly write down words that they associate with the words that I'm about to throw them. Words or phrases. Are you ready? Give me a thumbs up if you are. Good. The first word, violence. Write it down. Five, four, three, two, one. And can you show it up to all of us? Hurting people, poverty, violence begets violence, colonialism. Thank you. The next word. Are you ready for your next word? Next word is peace. Write it down. Peace. Okay. Up. Show it to us. Happiness. Engage everybody. Unity. Contentment. Thank you. And the last word, hope, write it down. Five, four, three, two, one, show it. Seven sacred teachings, peaceful, reconciliation, education. Thank you very much. Wendy, before I uh, turn it over to you, I'd like to thank all our panelists. Thank you very much for this extra time you're spending with Wendy and me. Not like you've, uh, I think you've already had enough of us for the past 10 weeks now, but soon our class is coming to an end. But before uh, we bring this to a close, I just want to tell everyone listening in about uh, the past month, there's been like about five or six typhoons that came to the Philippines and a lot of people are suffering flooding in the capital metro manila houses destroyed in the Bicol region flooding also in the north of luzon and for those of you who might be thinking how can i help how can i reach out to those um, who are suffering at the moment because in the philippines we get a lot of these um, the philippine national red cross their website <laughs> www redcross.org.ph is a good place to find a lot of information and also ways that you can help and contribute. So I hope you'll do that. Over to you, Wendy. Thanks, Mike. 
And a little postscript to you, Pamela. Patrick just put down a question, but sorry, we can't take his question at this point. You two will just have to chat later about that. <laughs> Mike, wonderful working together with you on this. Thank you, Eileen, Anzanur, Brina, Pamela. You brought heart and passion and, and wisdom and uh, a willingness to share your experiences this evening, this morning. So thank you so much. Audience, this has just been a sampling of the rich texts that we have examined thus far in our class. Texts that have centered on real stories from real people about real issues, issues that matter for all of us. We have centered our conversations around the idea that sharing our stories help in facing the truth to understand who we are, where we come from, what has been our past, and believing that we can become capable of understanding our strengths and weaknesses and in finding those capabilities to build bridges with others by listening to them with empathy and then trying to figure out how we ourselves can become a potent tool for social change. So thanks for joining us. We leave you to the telling of your own stories and discovering what your narratives reveal. Thanks to all of you who made this conversation possible. Signing off. Salamat. Gracias. Salam. Thank you. Kalina. Good evening. Good morning, Kalino. Peace. <laughs>